All right, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk a little bit about electron shells and understanding uh, the different shells, understanding how Bohr models are created and how electrons orbit the nucleus. So we're going to go ahead and start with what an electron shell is. An electron shell or an energy level is what uh, it's where the electrons actually appear around the nucleus. So electrons generally tend to behave in pairs, but uh, they're configured a certain way around the nucleus. So in order to know how many shells each element has, the first thing you have to look at is what period it's in. So uh, the number of electron shells an atom has is equal to the period that that element appears in on the periodic table. So for example, if we look at the periodic table and as a refresher, the periods go across and the groups go down, you'll see here period one, hydrogen and helium only have one electron shell. If you look at period two, lithium to neon, there in the second period, they have two electron shells. So the periodic table is organized so well that whatever period you're in is equivalent to the number of shells you have. So we have seven periods. The last uh, period has seven shells. So uh, looking at that, uh, electron shells orbit the nucleus and the outermost shell is called a valence shell. So we've spoken about a valence shell on more than one occasion. The valence shell is the shell that is the outermost shell and it is the shell that is involved in reactivity. So when we're looking at chemical reactions that occur, the shell that is involved in chemical reactions is called the valence shell. So looking at how electrons are placed in the electron shells, okay? The number of electrons in the outer shell or in the valence shell is listed uh, by group. So if you look at groups 1A through 8A, and if you look on the periodic table that you pasted in your notebook, you'll notice 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. We're not looking at the transitional elements right now. We're just looking at the non-transitional elements. If you look at the group number, the group number is equivalent to the number of electrons in the outer shell. Now, when we place electrons in the outer shell, it's important to know that the shells below it are full. Okay, now again, when we get to transition elements, it gets a little bit wonky, but we're not looking at transitions. So for all intents and purposes, all the shells below it are full. So we don't just start throwing electrons randomly everywhere. Okay, so looking at a Bohr model, let's actually create an element. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go with sulfur, okay? So sulfur, and I'm gonna build it here because I need a little bit of space. Sulfur is in the third period, okay? It is atomic number 16. That means it has 16 protons. And sulfur's atomic mass is 32.06, which rounds to 32. So 32 minus 16 is 16. So we calculate 16 neutrons, okay? Now, for electrons, and I like to do this in color to differentiate the shells. The first shell, I'm gonna make blue, okay? And if you remember my previous video, the maximum number of electrons we can have in the first shell is two. So we're gonna have two electrons in the first shell, okay? In the second shell, we have a maximum number of eight electrons. Well, how many electron shells do we have in sulfur? Well, as I mentioned earlier, sulfur is in the third period, therefore it has three electron shells because the number of electron shells is equal to the period on the periodic table. 
So in the second shell, it has eight electrons. That's the maximum number of electrons you can have in the second shell. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's got eight electrons in the second shell. Now, two plus eight is 10. We have 16 protons and 16 neutrons. Well, if we have 16 protons, that means we have to have 16 electrons because this is a neutral atom. If we have 16 electrons, but we have already placed three of them, well, then that means, I mean, I'm sorry, if we've already placed 10 of them, then that means we have six remaining. So our third shell, Our third shell has one, two, three, four, five, six. And you may wonder why I go around instead of just going around in a circle. As I mentioned, they tend to behave in pairs. And because they're behaving in pairs, um, I like to place them in pairs. So they go across with their partner. Okay, now, if you notice, I have two plus eight is 10, plus six is 16, 16 electrons. I have six in the outer shell. That means the outer shell is not full. No matter how many electrons it would take to fill the outer shell, and as we get into the much heavier elements, you can get as far as even 32. But in the uppermost elements, if you're uh, placing them, having eight is stable. And if you have eight, which is stable, you're happy, but this only has six, which means it needs to gain two more electrons in order to fill its outer shell. Now, it could either gain two more electrons or it could lose the six that it has. It would bring it to a lower energy state if it gained the two rather than lose the six. It takes the least amount of work to do that. So oxygen would gain two electrons, or I'm sorry, sulfur would gain two electrons. And as it would gain its two electrons and get to an outer energy level of eight, it would then become physically stable, but electrically it would have an oxidation number of S minus. In other words, it would have a charge of negative two because it has two more electrons than it has protons. I hope this information was helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop me a line. Uh, in the meantime, happy studying and I'll see you tomorrow.